This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Podker. Lasers have long energized our imaginations, providing the futuristic weaponry and lightsabers of science fiction. But in reality, light-based technologies enable our modern lifestyles, from high-speed communications to advances in manufacturing. Underlying these innovations are basic properties, materials, and designs. The NSF Zetawatt Equivalent Ultra Short Pulse Laser System, or ZEUS, is the highest power laser system in the United States, providing world-leading capabilities for scientific, medical, defense, and industrial research. Our guest today is Carl Krushelnik, the Harry J. Gomberg Professor of Nuclear Engineering and Radiological Sciences and Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, as well as the Director of the Gerard Moreau Center for Ultrafast Optical Science at the University of Michigan, which houses Zeus. Professor Krushelnik, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. So let's start with what is the Zeus facility? Um, the, the Zeus uh, facility is a big laser, and so it's funded by the National Science Foundation um, as a part of its mid-scale infrastructure program. And so it is a, a laser which is capable of uh, producing the highest power and consequently the highest intensity um, focused light uh, in the United States, and it's a, a user facility. Um, so it provides uh, a place for scientists from around the world to come to do experiments uh, using this uh, kind of u- unique ultra high power uh, laser. Uh, so there's a couple concepts in there I want to uh, kind of explain to the general audience. You talked about focus light and you mentioned it being the most powerful laser. What do these two things have uh, in common? How are you use- like what are you using them to study? So the the Zeus laser is not you, it's a laser system. So it's not just one laser. It's right. a, a number of different la- lasers, maybe ten or twenty, all working together to produce one um, ultra high power pulse of of light, um, which is in the near infrared, um, which is just outside um, um, our uh, where our eyes can uh, detect radiation. It's uh, a, an ultra short pulse as well, so it reaches this high power because not just because it has a huge amount of energy, but because it is really, really a short duration pulse. And so the um, the shortest duration um, phenomena that human technology can make is a burst of light, and so um, we're relying on that technology to make really, really short duration bursts of light, and then put as much energy into that burst of light, as many photons as we can, in order to produce a really high power. So the peak power of Zeus will, when it's fully operational, will be three petawatts, um, which is three uh, times 10 with uh, uh, 15 zeros behind it. Um, And that is, if you think of, of the whole power generation capacity of the Earth, which is only eight terawatts, which is eight with 12 zeros. So it's um, about a thousand times or 500 times um, bigger than the entire power generation capacity of the earth. And we, and we do this not by using all that energy, but by actually only producing um, a really, really short pulse of light. So power is again, energy divided by time. And if you put a moderate amount of energy in an alt, really, really short pulse, in our case, um, 25 femtoseconds, and that's 10 to the minus 15 seconds, that produces uh, a really, really high power, just but only for a really short time period. And then we focus that using a mirror, curved mirror, um, uh, because the light is is so uh, intense that it uh, can't actually go through a lens made of glass, so we have to bounce it off of mirrors, and if we if we bounce it off of a curved mirror, we can focus it to a small spot, and then that that means intensity. So, power divided by how how well you can focus the light produces intensity, which is equivalent to, uh, which is proportional to um, the electric field as well of the of the light. So it's a it's a unique type of thing. It's a this ultra high power um, concentrated source of photons. Um, which we can use um, to do uh, a wide range of experiments. It's uh, 
capability that a lot of our, our users are interested in doing just a wide variety of, of different types of experiments that are possible um, with, this, uh, with this laser system. Can we break it down a little bit with what some of those uses might be? What kind of physics might they be studying or what, what kind of information are they trying to confer or get at? So the, uh, what the laser does, um, it, it, it is, uh, again, really high power. And when it's focused, it produces really high intensity, which then, uh, is equivalent to having a very strong electric field. And what that, what that intensity can do is, is to make a plasma. Um, and a plasma is to rip the electrons off of, uh, of the, of the atoms and to create a really hot ionized gas has some uh, very unique properties which are of interest for studying. So one of the things is that the motion of an electron in, in, the, in the laser field is, uh, is really rapid. Okay, so it moves very, very fast. In fact, um, with Zeus, these, uh, these electrons will move almost the speed of light. And so um, they're relativistic, really, really highly relativistic. And so one of the things about the, when you um, produce um, a relativistic plasma is instead of um, heating something up, you know, you think of something, something that's hot and uh, if you if you heat it up with a with a lower power laser, you just heat it up and it expands in every direction at the same time. However, when the interaction is relativistic, things start to change and and the actual directionality uh, becomes comes into play. And so in, instead of producing like a big ball of hot plasma, one produces beams of particles. And so one then has uh, an exchange of momentum from the from the laser from the direction of the lasers firing into um, beams of particles in the plasma. So, it, so one of the applications is um, to make um, accelerators, to make particle beams on a smaller scale, to make beams of electrons, or and consequently to make high energy beams of neutrons, of protons, beams of, of uh, positrons, pions, uh, pretty much anything our users can think of, um, we can we can do that in a in a different sort of environment from conventional accelerator technology. Um, so that's one whole area of research that our users are interested in, um, developing advanced accelerators to try to find new ways of making particle beams. And then particle beams themselves have a, a huge a wide range of uh, applications, both scientific and for industry, um, for medical imaging, for example, or even for things like high energy physics. You know, what's the next... Um, technology that's going to produce um, uh, TEV electron colliders could be a laser source. Um, and that's one of the things, one of the types of experiments um, that have been worked on. Another, another kind of experiment is to try to um, mimic some of the physics that occurs in other parts of the galaxy um, or parts of the universe. Um, the universe um, is made of dark energy and dark matter, but of the stuff that we can see, um, which may be only a small fraction of the, of the total mass of the universe, uh, most of it is plasma. And a, a lot of that is relativistic plasmas. And a lot of the kind of cool, interesting stuff that, um, that astronomers study are, you know, quasars and, and uh, relativistic jets coming from black holes. And so the, in a laboratory sense, you know, in a, an astronomer can measure this, the structure of these things that exist in other parts of the universe, but um, they can't tweak it. They can't change the phenomenon. And um, often when you're trying to understand it, you use large scale um, simulations, um, computer simulations. However, if you can do some of the physics, look at some of those phys same physics in the laboratory and compare it directly with a, a computer model, um, you can uh, gain under um, further understanding. And so that's another kind of range of experiments that are possible. For example, we can make uh, really large magnetic fields, and then look look at how those magnetic fields interact with each other, and look at some of the uh, the dynamics and some of the physics that are produced when the magnetic field um, topologies change. And those are those can be um, relevant for things like um, the the physics going on in a neutron star um, atmosphere, for example, um, to generate um, different types of shock waves. There's a lot of interesting physics that people are interested in from on that side. 
The third thing is um, the fact that we can actually um, focus the light to a really, really um, high intensity, meaning that the electric field is really strong. And that, that, we, and that also um, uh, implies that we can enter a new regime of science in order to be able to study nonlinearities in things like uh, uh, quantum electrodynamics. So the, the electric fields are so, har so high that just by focusing the light um, into vacuum, um, suddenly uh, matter can appear just because of this super strong electric field and um, electrons and positron pairs can just uh, start to be emitted from, from the vacuum. So we're generating light matter from light in this case. So that's an that's a interesting, um, to how to get to that point um, and how to do those experiments is, is uh, also of interest to, um, to uh, our users. And it's, it's one of the kind of flagship experiments that we're gonna be trying. Um, the actual limit, um, uh, the fields you need to actually generate um, matter, electron, positron pairs to just bubble up from the vacuum just by, f by having a huge electric field are really, really, really strong. And that's um, actually, the, that, that was calculated by Julian Dwinger, who's a, a very famous, um, one of the founders of quantum electrodynamics uh, uh, more than 50 years ago. It's called the Dwinger limit, um, which is actually, when you calculate it, is actually much higher than our, um, our laser, the, the electric field that our laser can produce. So we get around that by an, instead of um, interacting, just directly focusing our laser into, into nothing, we actually collide it with an um, a, a electron beam and, and using um, a transformation, the, the electron beam sees a, as its electron beam is going close to the speed of light, it sees an electric field which is actually much higher in its own frame of reference. And you can suddenly start getting electron positron pairs emitted from that interaction. So in our in our case, we're designed to generate electron beams using our laser-based accelerators and then colliding them with a ultra high intensity short pulse burst of light. And um, from that to uh, do these experiments in uh, nonlinear uh, quantum electrodynamics. You, so you talked a little bit about particle accelerators. And I think the for people that do know what those are, they're thinking about something like CERN and and the size of that being bigger than a city, let's say. Can you talk a little bit about how big physically the Zeus laser system is? So the the Zeus laser is uh, in a clean room. So it is maybe, I would say about uh, 5,000 square feet. Um, so it is on a, a, a series of optical tables. It has a lot of components. Um, and so again, it's not just one um, a laser in a box, you know, as in your uh, barcode reader at the grocery store. Right. Um, it is a number of different lasers and it goes through a series of, of amplifiers. Um, so it starts out with a short laser pulse and it goes through a series of amplifiers which gradually increase the energy um, until it gets to um, uh, three petawatts. The, the technology um, that was, uh, was critical for producing these ultra high intensity pulses um, was developed by the, uh, the founder of our center at the University of Michigan, um, who won the Nobel Prize for this in uh, 2018, um, Gerard Moreau. However, you know, technology is always developing. And one of the things that um, is developing for lasers is, is that the power is going up, you know, uh, year by year as the material properties and understanding of, of how these beams propagate and get amplified um, becomes better. And so things are getting um, smaller and more compact. One of the things I know that uh, you kind of mentioned different different substrates, different kind of things you could hit with the lasers and learn different things. And I'd like to ask you a little bit about target materials and how you might learn different kinds of facts about it or generate different photons and that kind of thing. Yeah, so um, the electric field um, uh, interacts with the charged particles, and so it wiggles the electrons. And almost instantaneously, just it doesn't really require that much intensity to rip the electrons off of a of an atom. So we we start off obviously with a, a material which is uh, non-ionized, um, 
And it can be either a solid or it could be a, a gas or it could be um, a liquid. So it depends on on the particular uh, type of experiment that's of interest. So for example, the, the Zeus laser is is so intense, um, it is basically a um, something like a, a foot in diameter, but uh, you, can, you can think of a, a, a flying pancake of light. So, but it's only maybe one tenth the thickness of a human hair, but it's about a, about twelve inches in diameter, flying through space. But it can't. It's so intense that as it, if it propagates through air, it'll ionize the air and it'll produce a plasma and have all sorts of instability. So it needs to go through a vacuum. And so we have uh, uh, 100 meters of vacuum beam lines for our laser pulse to propagate through. And then it's focused onto, for example, could be a, a jet of gas or a, a solid material or a flowing liquid, and the interaction would occur on, on any, in any of those. But as it's being focused into it, as it's being focused, typically it won't interact with the material until it reaches its 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 peak intensity. Special thanks to Carl Krushelnik and Slava Lukin. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.